Hello everyone, this is Julie Sire. This week's topic is cognitive development, which is from chapter two of the Wolfolk textbook. So Wolfolk provides a set of object objectives for this chapter. In fact, she presents objectives for each chapter. And while these are useful in understanding which of the core concepts to hone in on, I also provide a list of hot topics which are more specific to what you will be tested on in this course. Those are listed at the bottom of the hot tip assignment sheets provided in the modules. So be looking for those. Um, I will also present those more specific topics in the video presentation. So this week, the things you need to have down are to know the different types of development, to know the three agreed upon principles of, a de of development, to understand the three continuing debates surrounding development and their implications. You also need to know the principles and stages presented in Piaget's theory of cognitive development to be able to explain the principles presented in Vygotsky's theory of social cultural cognitive development. And then lastly, lastly to be able to identify the theories of Vygotsky and Piaget in action. Now that last bullet point I will not be covering in today's lecture. However, you will be able to find um, a short quiz which I will post sometime this week and that will help you with that. As a starting point, let's begin with the definition of development. Wolfolk defines it as the changes that occur in human beings between conception and death. So everything from the moment the sperm meets the egg to the point when we draw our last breath. It includes four primary errors, the physical and the pictures on the right provide a concrete reminder of how the body changes over time. Well, these changes are obviously easy to see and record, but the three others are much less visible. And those three others are the personal, our personality, the social, or our relations to, to other people, and the cognitive, or our thinking and reasoning. Although these changes are not visible, it is easy to imagine, however, that the babies pictured on the left would have far less developed cognitive skills than the two elderly picture, pictured on the right. There are three general principles of development, which theorists and students and educators like ourselves believe are true. People develop at different rates, so that Tommy might learn to walk at eight, 14 months, while his little sister Meg might not do so until 16 months. Both are normal, just different. We can also agree that there is a, there is a progression to development, i.e. that it is relatively orderly. We learn to crawl before we walk, we learn to babble before we can talk, etc. The last principle is that development is gradual. That is, it happens over time. In fact, it may be so gradual that it escapes our notice, as may be the case of someone who experiences a growth spurt who seemingly shoots up overnight, but had probably been growing up a little, growing a little at a time over a period of weeks or months without anyone noticing or recording the differences. Despite the fact that there are these agreed upon principles, there are also bits of controversy still associated with development. The three, the three central debates are listed here. Is it nature or nurture? Nature, our, the nature argument says we are born to be the way we are based on genetics, heredity, biology. Na nurture says we develop into the people we are because of outside influences such as education, parenting, culture, society, etc. The second debate is, does development occur in continuity or discontinuity? Continuity says development occurs gradually and steadily. Discontinuity says development occurs in spurts. And then the third debate is, does development need to occur by certain points? So are there critical sensitive periods that if missed cannot be caught up? And the counter to that is it's never too late. Too late. Well, really, none of these can be proven definitively, which is why they're still being, being debated. And we can actually assume that both sides of each are true to a certain degree. What natural talents we have in terms of IQ, for instance, may also be shaped by the environment in which we grow up. So we may develop a preference for reading, which leads to better learning. The same is true of continuity and discontinuity. Let's take reading again. We learn to read after practicing over and over again until one day it just seemed to pull together so it seemed like it occurred in a spurt. Again, we can look at that growth spurt for another example. 
the last debate, critical periods versus it's never too late, also has areas of overlap. For instance, someone who cannot hear may miss the critical period for developing verbal communication, but with effort, they probably will be able to speak, but not necessarily as well as they would have if they had been able to hear. So no conversation about, the, about cognitive development would be complete without at least a cursory look at the brain itself. This diagram shows the different areas of the brain and which ones are associated with different areas of cognition. The frontal lobe, for instance, is associated with executive or higher mental function, such as concentration, judgment, creativity, etc. My only concern here is that we understand that different areas of the brain control different functions and cognition. You do not need to memorize this. It is here for reference only. The important thing to hone in on is the brain itself is made up of billions of cells. The most important of these transmit information. These information transmitting cells are called neurons. Each neuron has the processing capacity of a personal computer. What is even more startling is that a three pound brain is believed to have the information processing capacity of all the personal computers in the world combined. Wow. Of course, we process information differently than computers, so it is a bit like comparing apples and oranges. But even so, that is awesome to think about. The other thing to remember about neurons is that there are two parts of the cell that deal with transmitting all this information. These two parts are axons and dendrites. Axons send messages and dendrites receive them. An easy, to, an easy way to remember this is that axons ask questions, meaning they send information, but then dried stone. I know it sounds corny, but it should help you remember these on the test. There are some general facts about the cerebral cortex in the brain itself that I just wanted to briefly cover. So the cerebral cortex is the outer one-eighth inch of the brain. It, if we were to unfold it, it covers almost three square feet, so roughly the size of a seven or eight-year-old. It is the area that we think of as all the folds and wrinkles. It's 85% of the brain's weight. It is the last part of the brain to develop. And then again, different areas have distinct functions. And you can refer to that prior chart if you would like. But all areas need to work together for proper functioning. So the last piece of the biological brain that I want to cover is this idea of neuroplasticity. It is the concept that the brain changes. Remember those neurons sending and receiving information? Well, the more they send and receive messages, and depending upon how those messages relate to old information and messages, the more the brain itself changes. These changes are called neuroplasticity. There are three principles, or three parts, three things that contribute to neuroplasticity. They are repetition, practicing the fundamentals, so doing the core things, and then authentic environments. All of these contribute to whether or not changes occur, i.e. that learning is being done. So I will post a link to a video on neuroplasticity under module two that explains this concept in detail. In this chapter, we get our first glimpse at some of the theorists and researchers that have helped shape what we believe about learning. The two gentlemen pictured here, Jean Piaget and Lev Vygotsky. If you're going to go into education, you should know these gentlemen and their theories. In fact, they will come up over and over again. They're both brilliant and both have made substantial contributions to our understanding of learning. However, as we will see, their perspectives are quite different. So let's start with Piaget. Piaget was concerned with how people, in particular children, developed over time. He believed that development could be categorized into four stages, the sensory motor, the pre-operational, the concrete operational, and the former operational. In Piaget's theory, these stages are tied to particular ages. It's important to note, however, that these ages are not exact, and that if we follow our principles of development, we know that not everyone will fall neatly into these age brackets. The first stage in Piaget's theory is the sensory motor stage. In this stage, the child is primarily learning with his or her senses in movement, hence sensory motor. So 
sensory meaning senses and motor meaning movement. It is marked by the absence, this stage is marked by the absence and development of object permanence. That is the understanding that something can disappear but not be gone forever. The baby in the picture, for example, is trying to figure out why her bunny is gone. In real life, we might observe a toddler who is inconsolable when mommy leaves. So when the object disappears, it's gone forever. In the second stage, to toddler years to about first or second grade, we see a number of new developments. Children begin to talk, they learn the alphabet, they learn numbers, they may also begin to read. This period is marked by the absence of a few things like an understanding of time. Everything happens now. So if you ask about last week, they'll not, they won't know what you're talking about. They have difficulty understanding some concepts such as conservation. conservation. So the little girl on the left has no idea that the same amount of liquid is contained in both the tall glass and the short one. The tall one in her mind must contain more because it's taller, it's bigger. In the middle picture, we see a child's perception of the amount of milk in each jug. Notice how the small jug has the same amount of liquid even though it is considerably smaller. This is another example of conservation being missing. Also, the child is unable to conceive of how turning the jug would change the location of the liquid. The third picture on the far right shows the idea of the difficulties with consideration or understanding others' points of view. The child on the right wants the red letters and cannot conceive why the child on the left may want them too, and so we use grabbing instead of asking. The third stage is the concrete operational stage. At this point, a child is able to think and do things that are put in front of them. The child on the left, for example, can recognize the two strawberries are the same amount as the two strawberries cut up into four pieces. If we look at our water jugs, we can see that the same child from the previous slide is able to understand, at age seven, is able to understand how water will fill a jug differently depending upon how the water is turned. By age 10, they would also have grasped that the smaller jug would be fuller. If we look at the child on the, on the far right, we can also see that they are at this age capable of sorting and organizing. The fourth and final stage in development in Piaget's theory of development is the formal operational stage. At this point, a child, and we need to put child in quotes because we're looking at adolescence to adulthood, at this point, a child is able to think abstractly. They can apply principles to different situations and learn to think both inductively and deductively. That is, they're able to take the information they have and generalize it or make it more specific depending upon the situation. The most commonly used example of formal operations is the ability to do higher operations math. But formal operations is much more about reasoning than just math. A person at this stage could use information they learned in a sociology course, for example, to explain the behavior of their 13-year-old nephew. In addition to the stages, Piaget also believed that people, especially children, since that was his main area of focus, develop what he called schemas or systems of organization. These systems of organization are reorganized when they are presented with new information. This reorganization takes two forms, either assimilation or accommodation. With assimilation, they can take the new piece of information and assimilate it into the old organizational framework. In the example pictured on the slide, the schema is cow, animals with four legs and horns, and the new information is the moose. The child will assume the moose is just another cow. Thus, she takes the new information and puts it into the old organizational scheme. That's assimilation. The second type of reorganization is called accommodation, and this involves modifying the existing schema. In the example pictured, the child adjusts or accommodates the new concepts of moose and mommy and baby moose. The schema is expanded and adjusted to fit the new information. So assimilation and accommodation leave us in a good spot to begin talking about our second cognitive theorist, Lev Vygotsky. Vygotsky was not at all concerned about stages of development, but rather he believed that children learn through interaction. Starting with the next slide, we will talk in more detail about his view of cognitive development. 
In Vygotsky's theory, every function, i.e. bed of knowledge, appears two times. First, it appears between the people where it is observed. This is the intrapsychological, and then it is internalized, the intrapsychological. In this picture, for example, the child is learning through an interaction with an adult. He will take in what is being said and then puzzle it out within himself. Another tenet of Vygotsky's theory is that knowledge is co-constructed. Others help us learn. Again, it is an outside-in process. The final tenet or belief that Vygotsky held was that cultural tools such as symbols and technology shape how we learn. Basically, it is saying we are shaped by the tools of our culture and what we have available to us. For example, a child today would learn the times tables, whereas a child in pre-modern China would use may have used an abacus to calculate quantities. But the thing that Vygotsky is most commonly remembered for is the zone of proximal development, or ZPD. The zone of proximal development is the area between where a learner's thinking is currently and where it can be with some guidance and assistance. If we were to physically chart out this thinking, we could think of it as being the areas the area closest to or in closest proximity to their current knowledge and thinking. Take a look at the diagram on the left. The zone of proximal development is the blue-green area in the middle. There is another term that Vygotsky is often associated with, although it is not part of his original theory, and that is scaffolding. Scaffolding describes the actions that someone, say a teacher, parent, etc., may take to help a child or learner. The picture on the right provides some examples of scaffolding that would typically take place in a classroom. So remember, the zone of proximal development is a cognitive area, whereas the scaffolding is a strategy that is used to help. So that covers what I wanted to share with you about Chapter 2. I have already uploaded videos on both Piaget and the zone of proximal development if you want to gain more perspective and understanding. Other than that, I will see you on the discussion boards.